Hello, everyone. Um, good afternoon for those on the East Coast. Good morning to everyone else. This is uh, Trent Taylor, um, and I'd like to welcome everyone to the Food and Product Labeling Litigation and Regulatory Update, our last one of 2021. Um, I will be your Master of Ceremonies today, and we're going to jump right in just because we have a full agenda today. Uh, we really appreciate everyone joining us and uh, your attendance here today. Um, so here is our illustrious panel who most of you know. Uh, two notes. Uh, first of all, Ben Abel, who typically handles our food and beverage labeling section, uh, is unable to join us, we think, uh, because he's covering a deposition today. Um, he did uh, put together the slides, and Frank Talbot and I will be covering his section, but there is a small chance that he will be able to join us. So if, if he's able to, uh, then he will. Um, also wanted to welcome in Frank Talbot, uh, who will help uh, cover Ben's section, as I just mentioned, but he also will be introducing a new short section on sales practices. Uh, we're seeing a lot more litigation in this area, um, you know, that's sales practices other than labeling. Uh, and Frank is an expert on this. He's handled a number of class actions um, in this area, some with me, and so he's going to talk briefly about that area. Um, here is our roadmap. It's pretty similar to what we've done in the past. Uh, I will start off with covering some trends. Kate and Royce will handle regulatory. Uh, Jenny will handle product labeling. Either myself and Frank or Ben will be handling food and beverage labeling litigation. Frank will be handling sales practices, and Alicia will be handling Prop 65. As always, uh, if you have any questions uh, today, feel free to use the Q&A feature on this platform and submit them, and we'll try our best to answer them during this uh, broadcast. If not, then we will do it afterwards. Um, and that goes you know, for, for any questions you might have later on as well. If you ever think of a question about uh, in this area or in this space, you should feel free to email or call us at any time. Uh, we always love talking about this and hearing from folks about um, these types of things. Um, one thing I wanted to, to flag, and, and those who attended last quarter will remember I did. I said this last quarter, um, that I would be sending out a survey at the end of this uh, webinar. Um, we didn't get that out just because we, we were messing around with the format of it, and we've made it, I think, a lot more user-friendly. We actually will be sending out a short survey uh, at the end of the webinar today. We have it all ready to go. Um, as you know, we put a lot of time and energy into this, and we really enjoy putting on these webinars. But we want to make sure that we're talking about what matters to you. So we're going to be sending out this short survey to some of our attendees. And if you get uh, that link, we would love for you to take a couple minutes. It's very short, uh, and we'd love to get your feedback. And everyone who responds will receive some type of treat uh, as an incentive to fill it out. So. Um, oh, and also one other thing. Um, as you know, last time we did a pumpkin spice giveaway, pumpkin spice bonbons. We expect to do the same for a drawing of Festivus themed cookies for some lucky attendees today. All right, let's get into our theme. Our theme today, as you know, we try to have fun with our theme. Uh, today it is Festivus, which is December 23rd. And hopefully most of you are familiar with the concept of Festivus from an episode in the last season of Seinfeld. Um, I will tell you that one of our presenters today, who shall remain nameless, had never heard of Festivus before. And you feel free to guess who that presenter might be in the chat feature. Um, I actually have a Festivus ugly sweater I was going to wear today, but our, our video, we're having video problems, so we're not able to show it. So. Um, if anyone is interested, I'm happy to send you a picture of my Festivus-themed ugly sweater. Um, for those who don't know what Festivus is, uh, here's sort of the origin story. I'm not going to spend time on it, um, other than Frank Costanza uh, decided to come up with it uh, as an alternative to sort of the, you know, buying Christmas gifts and that kind of thing. Uh, some of the ways to celebrate Festivus um, is a Festivus pole. Uh, aluminum pole that's on a stand instead of a real tree because Frank Costanza finds tinsel distracting. Um, there's also an airing of grievances 
and feats of strength, both of which we will be talking about and using within our presentation a little bit later. And one other note before we jump into the trends is our gift to you this year. Uh, just like George in the same episode where Festivus was introduced, we are making a charitable donation to the Human Fund on behalf of all of our attendees. Uh, so the Human Fund is a great charity. It's money for people. All right. Um, we're going to jump right in to some trends. I will be handling this portion of the program. Um, as most of you know, we track all cases filed in this space. And uh, it, it really leads to some really interesting uh, trends that we're able to see when we do that. And since our last, last webinar on September 23rd, there have been 121 new labeling class actions. It's actually 123 because two more were filed last night after we put this slide together. Uh, and both involved benzene in personal care products, which we will be talking about quite a bit today. Um, now, the, the sort of the breakdown between food and beverage products versus other products is about evenly split, and that was the case last time as well. But we've seen a significant increase from last time in the number of case filings we've had. The pace has increased 50%. And you have to remember that we're measuring a short, shorter time frame this time than we did last time. So we've adjusted based on that um, shorter time frame, and we have a lot more class actions. Um, here's just a chart just sort of depicting that breakdown. No need to linger on that. Um, so where are these cases being filed? Uh, we previously identified a potential shift away from California, and that trend has accelerated. Um, as you can see here from this chart, California has only the third most cases, and this is federal court filings, has only the third most cases filed in this space since September 23rd. <coughs> the most is New York. New York federal courts had 39, and I think actually that's gone up uh, above 40 now. And that is a 97% increase over the last time period we measured. Uh, we think there's several reasons why. One, the California courts are uh, becoming, um, uh, I guess, less sympathetic to these types of claims. Plus, some of the plaintiffs' counsel who are filing these cases are based in New York, including Sheehan and Sulzer, Burser and Fisher is an East Coast, um, mainly an East Coast law firm as well. Um, and they often file in New York federal courts. One other thing, the flag, Illinois continues to see a lot of filings, especially by Spencer Sheehan, who we'll talk about here in a few moments. Um, so who is filing these lawsuits in the last you know, two, plus, two and a half months or so? And um, you see some familiar names on here. Spencer Sheehan leads the pack. Um, we also have Bursar Fisher, Clarkson, and Sulzer. And uh, oh, we have a cameo here from Jackie Childs from Seinfeld, our favorite plaintiff's lawyer. Um, but if you look on the left-hand side, this has the actual numbers. Um, Sheehan, uh, 29 new cases, new labeling class actions since, since September 23rd. And that's actually, he's actually increased his rate of filing, and, and it's by 52% over last quarter. Uh, I know that he was already on a torrid pace um, in terms of filing these suits, and he's actually increased it. Um, he even had one last month targeting a camera um, and another one targeting infant formula because, and I quote, it does not contain the same components as breast milk. So um, he's sort of expanding uh, the types of suits that he's finding to a certain degree. All right, what are the product the types of products that are being targeted by these class action labeling suits. Um, lots of personal care products, as you can see here. Let me get to the next slide with the actual numbers. Um, personal care products, 37 new labeling class actions. And that's an 88% increase over the last quarter. Uh, Jenny's going to be talking about these in a little more detail later, so I will not linger over them. Um, but I think it's interesting that that is sort of leading the way right now. Um, okay, what are the labeling claims that are being targeted? 
as you can see the graph, benzene or products that um, you know are, are being marketed as safe that are allegedly not safe is leading the way. And uh, there have been 35 suits uh, related to benzene or other claims that product is safe. We have 25, and so going back to benzene, that's a veritable feeding frenzy um, related to those right now, and it's expanding. It started with deodorant, uh, excuse me, with sunscreen. Uh, it's moved on to deodorant. Now it's moving on to body sprays and other types of sprays as well. As I mentioned, there were two more filed like, just last night that I saw. Uh, ingredient claims continue to be, ingredient and flavoring claims, I should say, um, continue to see a lot of those. That's mostly Spencer Sheehan. Uh, one note that I did want to flag for everyone, uh, greenwashing or environmental claims. There were 15 filed um, in this uh, since September 23rd, and that is a 300% increase than what we saw over the last quarter. Um, why does that matter? Um, it, this is something that I know we've been talking about a lot, which is um, we're, we expect this to be an explosion of claims going forward, and we're starting to see that. Um, these types of claims are very, very effective. We, I recently saw an article suggesting that about 90% of consumers have a preference for products that are marketed as green friendly in some form or fashion. Uh, so it resonates with consumers and plaintiff's counsel um, have been and will continue to be targeting these types of claims. All right, a few takeaways. Um, more cases, mostly in New York and Illinois. A lot of benzene ingredients and greenwashing claims, and natural and no preservative claims continue to be the gift that keeps on giving, as there are still a fair number of those lawsuits as well. Um, feats of strength, I want to do this very quickly so we can get to our other uh, speakers. Feats of strength, uh, festivist tradition, we're going to use it to show what we have liked about 2021 for the industry. So what are some of the good things for the industry in 2021 that we've seen? First of all, um, certain plaintiff's counsel. And to be blunt, that's really uh, Spencer Sheehan. Um, as annoying as his proliferation of suits has been, in some ways it's been a good thing. It's been a gift because he has lost many of those suits and he has created a trail of great decisions for defendants. The number two and number three reasons up here are also um, directly related, at least in part, to Sheehan. We're seeing more. Uh, courts that are applying the reasonable consumer test, leading to more motions to dismiss granted. And we're seeing some labeling litigation fatigue among some judges, especially in the Northern District of um, California. Um, we've seen some other great results in California courts on things such as equitable claims, standing, arbitration, future injunctive relief, and um, and going up to the Ninth Circuit as well. And, and that may explain why we are seeing more cases filed in New York and Illinois as well. Okay, airing of grievances is another festivist tradition, and we will use that to highlight a few of the not-so-great things for industry in 2021. More cases, as we just talked about. Uh, more cases in more jurisdictions. Um, class settlements, we continue to worry about class settlements becoming harder to get approved. The Brasino case from the Ninth Circuit has um, put a damper on claims made settlements in California, and we'll be watching, uh, especially appellate courts going forward, um, about what they do with some of these class settlements. Uh, we continue to see some not so great results in some places, uh, resulting in you know classes being certified and some expensive settlements. Although I will say, I think it's it's down over past years. So that is a good thing. And then, of course, there's the benzene feeding frenzy, which Jenny will be talking about. Um, here's my last slide for now. Uh, what to watch for in 2022. Um, greenwashing claims. I think we're going to see a lot more of those. Um, we'll be talking about that a little bit more in the rest of our webinar. Uh, will there be a spillover from the benzene suits into other types of litigation, other chemicals? Um, that's something else that I think Jenny's going to touch on a little bit later. Um, one thing I wanted to flag that, that we don't know what the implications are right now, but it's something to keep an eye on, and that's the non-delegation doctrine potentially being revived by the U.S. Supreme Court in the West Virginia v. EPA case. It could end up having huge consequences for all executive branch rulemaking and regulations, 
including those related to FDA and other um, executive branches that might have uh, rules and regulations affecting the industry. Uh, there's no oral argument date set for this case yet, but it's something we're going to be expected to be in the next three to four months, and we're going to be keeping a close eye on. Last one, and this is my segue to Kate and Royce. Uh, we expect there to be increased regulatory uh, in 2022 as well. And so with that, let me pass it over to Kate and Royce. Hey, how is everyone doing today? on this uh, wonderful, not yet Festivus, but soon to be Festivus day. Um, I'm Bruce Dubonet, I'm in Chicago, and I've got Kate Hardy with me in Charlotte, and we're just gonna keep cruising here. Um, so in case you didn't know this, you know, this is one of my favorite lines from Seinfeld, these pretzels are making me thirsty, famous Kramer line. Uh, FDA is starting to question uh, the Festivus dinner's standard of identity, and what do I mean by that? So we saw over the past year, you know, new, past couple of years, new foods and new types of foods making their way into the market that were things that we never really thought food science could do before, but food science has done. I'm talking about plant-based meats, uh, cell-grown um, products, all sorts of things like that. And we've seen an aggressive uh, stance by states and state legislatures to create standards of identity for foods. And that's, um, you know, what do you call ice cream? What do you call French vanilla ice cream? Things like that, uh, official codified standards for food. And in absence of those for some of these new food products, states have, you know, as we've said in past webinars, have tried to define what is butter, what is beef, what is milk. This isn't a USDA thing. This is, we're talking really FDA here. FDA issued a, a guidance and said, look, you know, we're going to step into this game. We're going to begin issuing temporary marketing permits for food that doesn't necessarily meet a standard of identity. And these permits are going to give you, uh, call them modern day indulgences from FDA, are going to give you an ability to market a product in interstate commerce without fear of FDA questioning the standard of identity or the labeling. It's really unique for FDA to do this. Um, it gives you 15 months uh, test market period. You need to submit your label to FDA, which we'll get into. If y'all who have products that are regulated by USDA know that part of the process, you submit a label to USDA, USDA blesses it, says it's good. You get something called preemption. You also don't have to worry about USDA coming back and necessarily hitting you up on that label. FDA may be doing the same thing. Um, and you submit your label to FDA, uh, it's per product. I believe FDA is leaning, I have to reread it specifically, but it's leading towards industry saying you can submit for industry, but it still needs to list the product there. But wh where is this going? Um, it's great that FDA is stepping in here and starting to regulate this space, but are we heading for, and this is uh, from the episode where Kramer and uh, Newman believe that Michigan can give them better rebates uh, or redemption on their cans so they steal a post office truck and drive cans to Michigan. Um, it looks like we may be heading to preemption. And preemption is one of those, um, I didn't do well in con law, so I'm, I'm going to butcher it, but uh, preemption is one of those things where because of FDA's authority uh, and the preemption of federal law, if FDA is saying that a label looks good, and is good and can be sold in commerce, what does that do for a state law that says that a food needs to be called a certain way? So if I've got like, you know, plant-based meat being called one thing and FDA says that that's okay, but then I've got the state of Louisiana that says, you know, this is hypothetical, that crawfish can never be plant-based, where does that put us in the world of preemption? Um, is it a defense? Where does FTC fall into all of this? Because FDA is now officially approving labels. I think what happened here was FDA jumped into this mess and didn't really think through all of the issues. So I think this is something to watch. Um, happy to, to talk offline about where I think it's going. But this is interesting. This is an interesting development. And it didn't really get a lot of, I think, press or attention. But for those out there in experimental foods, this is, this is big stuff and something to watch. 
Um, personally, I think there's an argument to be made uh, that, you know, if FDA is blessing something, um, you know, let's roll with it. But, you know, more analysis needs to be done, obviously. Uh, next major development in the world of FDA, going back to the Festivus theme, potential doll fighting over FDA's commissioner. Um, Robert Califf is an old guard of FDA, not, not a Beltway, uh, you know, bureaucratic insider like um, some of the other folks at FDA, but, you know, he, he's been around. He was, he was Obama's commissioner. I, I actually met him once, I think. He was, he was okay. Um, cardiologist, uh, physician, his game is largely focused on the drug industry. Um, it's, you know, he, he's not really one for food. He doesn't come from the food side of things. He's a physician, very empirical, very data-driven, very much about, about drugs, but also worked in industry, um, worked for a company that was, um, um, you know, you know, managed by Google. Um, so, you know, I think I'm looking forward to him being at FDA. Uh, I, I'm looking forward to seeing where he takes the agency. Um, you know, he, he did a lot for tobacco. Uh, he focused a lot of time on drug development improvement. So, you know, where is that going to fall in terms of food? And, you know, is he going to be, um, you know, seen as someone that can work with industry? I, I think so. I think, you know, given his past uh, drive and his past familiarity with industry and his past compromising abilities, I, I think that, you know, this is the commissioner that, you know, we, we can probably have a little bit more familiarity with some of the concerns that industry has. Um, next one, Kramer's chicken enforcement trends recap for November. Um, this is just kind of a highlight of where we're going with FDA. And, and what I've seen out there um, looking at what the agency is doing, um, you know, good, bad, excellent, um, it, it's all out there. Uh, there's been an increased attention in foreign supplier verification programs and compliance with those requirements. Those are, you know, if, if you've got a factory in the United States and it's making food and you're getting maybe your rice from, you know, another country or you're getting, you know, some of your products from Central America, the FSV program is part of the food quality standards that you're required to comply with, which is you need to audit or give assurance, basically, that you know that your supplier is um, providing quality and safe um, product. It's an area to forget about. It's an area where maybe newer companies don't really think about. So we've seen increased attention and warning letters issued in that area. Um, there's still a huge drive by FDA to go after vapes. Uh, we're not talking jewels or other products. We're talking some of the outlier vapes out there. Um, something to keep in mind if, if you are stocking vape products in your store to double check that they are operating within the guardrails of where FDA has said e-cigarettes are. And the reason I mention that is because a lot of times these go together with foods. Um, we think that there's going to be a possible finalized ban on menthol cigarettes um, with implications on other products. This is not a tobacco webinar, but this is hitting at what I think is FDA's continued drive at ensuring products are safe um, for all users and also focusing on products that may appeal to certain groups, children, um, others that that, you know, if you can get rid of one aspect of it, such as a flavoring, uh, FDA's belief is that possibly there would be a decrease in tobacco utilization um, by those groups. Um, pet food CGMP issues, we've seen a lot of uptick in warning letters issued around pet food. Uh, pretty egregious examples. We're not talking like your normal, um, you know, forgot to document something or do a CAPA. Uh, these, are, these are pretty big issues that we've seen. So that, that's kind of where the enforcement for November has been. Um, moving away from FDA for a second, uh, what's going on with the world of marijuana? So we've seen over the past couple of years, we've seen like a very steady trend for marijuana legalization across the country. Um, and, and when I say marijuana, I also mean cannabis. I mean hemp. I mean CBD. I mean all of that stuff. 
we have seen um, a increase in this trend for legalization and we hit a roadblock um, in South Dakota. And with South Dakota, there was a voter amendment to the state constitution for rec recreational legalization of marijuana, about 54% of the vote. And, you know, I'm not an expert in South Dakota constitutional law, unfortunately. Um, I missed that class in law school. But uh, apparently there was a technical argument about why the results of the, the amendment were not okay. Went up to the Supreme Court. Supreme Court nullified the voter amendment. And we're not talking like legislature. We're talking about the people of South Dakota put something on the ballot and approved it. And um, the governor of South Dakota had a, had a pretty, um, uh, had their own position on, you know, marijuana in the state. And it's kind of our first example of a state unwinding a voter initiative for marijuana. And it's been part of a growing effort by some uh, to, to question about whether or not marijuana or cannabis has a place um, in, at the state level. So it's a risk to think about if you're in the cannabis industry. It's, you know, we're not seeing a whole scale, you know, reversion here back to the, you know, what, what, what was before like complete national ban on cannabis at the state level and federal level. But it's something to remember that, you know, we saw this trend and we think everything's going the right way, but speed bumps are possible. It's just something to think about. It's an added risk for if you're in the cannabis industry. And Kate, I think you had a thought there as well. Yeah, I'll just real quickly add, I mean, we will probably see a, a whole lot of movement in different states as we move into 2022. I mean, I think that the trend is uh, more towards the adult legalization, um, but these things are just changing very fluently and we're keeping an eye on it. Uh, so we'll have to see, I, from what I understand, South Dakota is going to get right back in it and uh, try again. So we'll see if they join the rest of the state. Yeah, we'll see what happens there. I, I, there's, uh, we're going on the next slide, but last thing on that slide, there, there's been a talk of putting it back onto the ballot. Uh, not one of the most lucrative markets out there, uh, obviously, compared to California, Illinois, but still a market and um, still a great place to grow um, hemp and cannabis. Yeah, and Royce, on that note, I'll just touch really quickly because I, I know we have a lot of other information to cover sort of on the CBD side of things. I mean, we get calls, uh, I feel like, on a daily basis asking questions about CBD and what products can it be put in and you know, is it is it legal? Um, I'm actually going to start with the bottom of the slide. I mean, FDA um, has their current position on CBD. Uh, cannabinoid is part of an FDA-approved drug product. Um, therefore, at this time, it really cannot be put into um, foods, cosmetics, etc. cetera. Uh, there's lots of states, as we've talked about before, that are out there, um, you know, enacting laws saying, well, if, if you're in California, you can do this, or, you know, New York just passed a few things over this year. So it's very much um, still a checkerboard of different requirements. Um, there was an announcement just over the last couple of weeks, the National Industrial Hemp Council um, announced plans to try to develop some product testing and labeling standards for CBD. I think the goal with this and also the goal of sort of where FDA wants to get is um, to try to find a standard for testing and labeling and product quality that everybody can feel really good about before we're putting these products in the market. And I, we mentioned on our our last webinar, um, you know, there's definitely been some reports to CDC and other state poison control centers um, of folks having some issues with these products. Um, my understanding is that uh, the National Industrial Health Hemp Council will hopefully be working with FDA and um, trying to share whatever information they're able to put together from stakeholders and 
uh, going forward, hopefully we'll we'll see some good progress uh, so that folks have some good guidelines to to work with these products in the future. And with that, I will turn it over to Ginny, who will be talking about product labeling updates. Thanks, Kate. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm going to be talking about some product labeling. And uh, as Trent indicated, there's been a big uptick in class actions filed regarding personal care products. Um, the first on the list is um, batteries, which isn't really a personal care product, but I at least wanted to mention because um, as I've mentioned in I think almost every single webinar that um, I've participated in, uh, you know, one thing that you need to be very cognizant of when creating product labels is making sure that you can substantiate the claims that you're making on those products. Um, and in this Darren case that was filed in the Central District of California, the allegation is that Ener Energizer uh, falsely is marketing its AA uh, Max batteries, saying that um, falsely saying that they last 50% longer um, than your basic alkaline um, AA batteries. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out and to see if Energizer is going to be able to. Um, you know, substantiate those claims, but I at least wanted to include this because um, if you're going to be putting a, a claim on your label or a statement on your label about you know specific product uh, performance, definitely need to be able to substantiate that with testing and other documents, um, or it's really going to be opening yourself up to um, some significant liability. Because I mean, I think it's clear um, that plaintiff's attorneys are looking at and doing their own independent testing on products that are making claims such as, you know, 50% longer or making claims about um, product performance and, you know, going out and doing some independent testing. And if it's different than what the claim is made, then they're, you know, filing suit um, and, and filing suit with class actions. So uh, just another plug on, you know, making sure that your claims and statements on products are accurate and that you have that substantiation to uh, back that up. So moving more into the personal care products, um, again, no one that has been on these webinars before is going to be surprised to hear me talking about hand sanitizer. Um, it's been talked about for probably two years now. We started talking about it right before COVID hit, and then um, it became a real hot topic during COVID with some, you know, class actions being filed across the country and across um, manufacturers and distributors. Um, and we have yet another hand sanitizer. This is one of two that was recently filed, so it's still an area of interest for plaintiff's counsel. This one was filed against Target um, in the Northern District of Illinois. Again, as Trent pointed out, Illinois is becoming sort of a, um, a, a uh, feeding ground for plaintiff's lawyers to file class actions. Um, this one was filed alleging that Target had misled consumers that it's alcohol-based hand sanitizers capable of killing 99.99% of germs. Um, the next case um, that was filed is, you know, we've, we've talked previously, Ben has talked about um, pet food being targeted and sort of the food labeling um, area for class actions, and I wanted to highlight that now we're moving into personal care products for pets being um, on the chopping block for, for plaintiffs. And this particular case that was filed in the Southern District of New York, another, you know, um, hot area for class actions to be filed, as Trent pointed out, um, involves uh, Burt Bees and they're the defendant, and the plaintiff is alleging that defendants um, massively deceived pet owners by falsely labeling its collection of animal shampoos as 99.7% natural. Um, you know, the natural allegation is one that we've talked about um, primarily in the food labeling, but, you know, we're starting to see it come into uh, product labeling um, and now obviously into pet personal care products. And then the last uh, personal care product that I wanted to mention 
um, that segues nicely with, you know, we hear a lot about THC and marijuana products from Kate and Royce on the regulatory side, but uh, we're starting to see those um, marijuana products being brought into class actions as well. This is an example. Um, this one was filed in Wayne County Circuit Court in Michigan, uh, where the plaintiff is alleging defendant exclusive brands LLC misrepresented the amount of THC in their marijuana products. They could charge a price premium. Um, and I just, you know, I wanted to highlight that you're starting to see um, marijuana products coming into that class action um, space. The next area uh, that I wanted to speak about is the benzene class actions. As Trent pointed out, this is a, a really hot topic um, or hot area for plaintiff counsel to be filing class actions on. Um, a ton have been filed in the last um, few months, primarily focused on sunscreen, which isn't super surprising. Um, I know over the summer, we talked about on our webinar, uh, the benzene sunscreen recall. It was a voluntary recall that was done uh, by Johnson & Johnson. And now we're starting to see um, a big uptick in benzene sunscreen class actions. Um, and, and they're kind of being filed all over the place, as you can see, Southern District of California, Eastern District of Missouri, Eastern District of New Jersey, I mean, excuse me, of New York, and then the District of New Jersey. Um, and essentially, the allegations in those is that the defendant uh, allegedly sold a sunscreen that contained benzene, which is unsafe and a carcinogen. Um, so, you know, that's something to definitely keep an eye on. And you're seeing that, you know, it's not just limited to Johnson & Johnson who have done that voluntary recall, but, you know, across um, manufacturers and, and products. You also see that bleeding over into other um, personal care products that may contain benzene. So once benzene sort of got on plaintiff counsel's radar, um, you start seeing other um, personal care products like body spray and deodorant that are making similar benzene allegations, you know, that the defendant made or sold um, the deodorant or body spray that contained an unsafe amount of benzene um, and, and filing suit. You see one here down in um, the Northern District of Illinois and this body spray one that was filed in the Southern District of Ohio. And actually, while we've been on the webinar, um, there was another uh, aerosol antiperspirant benzene um, that was filed by Reese LLP in the Southern District of California. So that just, you know, sort of goes back to what Trent and I were saying about um, how this is a real feeding frenzy um, and they, they just are almost rolling in um, daily new class actions. So that's definitely, I think, going to continue um, into 2022. The next a uh, hot area for product um, labeling class actions is what Trent has mentioned, which is this greenwashing, which is basically when um, the claims are made about a product being recyclable or compostable, um, pasture-raised, plant-based, or reef-friendly. Um, that's been something that I've seen that's been a new um, way to say, you know, something is, is green or, or earth friendly is this reef friendly um, label that's being put on um, some products. And, you know, you see it a lot with um, like this Niagara bottling um, and the Reynolds consumer products regarding, you know, recycling that the product is able to be recycled when actually it's not. Uh, we talked about this um, a few webinars ago, there was a, a trash bag company that had been sued um, that had, the, the plaintiff was saying that, the defendant was saying the trash bags were recyclable, but they actually were not. Um, and you're continuing to see that trend here at the end of 2021. Um, and I, I think Trent's absolutely right that the greenwashing is just going to be um, a real uh, hot area for plaintiffs to file suit in, um, in the product labeling area. 
The other um, update that I wanted to give is on PFAS. I know we've spent um, several webinars talking about PFAS and um, some class actions that have arisen uh, from products that allegedly contain PFAS. Um, but from a regulatory update, um, President Biden announced uh, recently that he um, a plan to combat PFAS, and it actually involves eight different agencies, which is pretty uh, sweeping. EPA is obviously at the front of that with a PFAS roadmap that it's working on, but DOD is working on cleanup efforts. FDA is expanding food supply testing. The Department of Agriculture is also involved in support of research into PFAS in the food system and taking action to prevent and address contamination. Homeland Security and FEMA um, have been tasked with investigating and remediating PFAS, particularly in protecting emergency responders. Um, and that relates to spe specific allegations regarding um, contamination of PFAS through um, fire suppressants. And then finally, the Department of Health and Human Services continues to review um, the evolving science on human health and PFAS. So, all of that is to say that PFAS, I think, you know, with the Biden administration announcing this plan to combat PFAS and getting eight agencies involved, um, it just highlights um, Trent's point earlier about, you know, um, the Biden administration, um, you know, really putting its, its foot on the gas pedal regarding um, regulatory um, action. And also, I think that you're going to see uh, just a continued uptick in PFAS um, class actions and litigation. Uh, with that, I'm going to pass it to Ben. Hey, everyone. This is Ben Abel, uh, not in abstention. I, I am here, um, uh, rappelling down from the rafters. I'm uh, going to talk briefly about uh, updates in the food and beverage uh, labeling space. I want to Try to move quickly so I can ensure that Frank and Alicia have enough time behind me. Uh, so uh, the first of those um, is uh, we may be slowly not talking as much uh, about vanilla and flavoring uh, uh, litigation. Those cases, uh, uh, largely filed by Spencer Sheehan, as, uh, as Trent discussed, have seemed to slow, um, if not stop entirely. However, uh, the kind of template of those suits has, has not slowed. Um, they've, they've just kind of expanded both in terms of the products at issue um, and uh, and uh, the, the jurisdictions. And so, for instance, there's a list here, uh, a number of different cases that kind of follow the same Sheehanian form, uh, whether it be cheese and tomatoes on a pizza product or, or smoke, the smoked part of a, a smoked cheese uh, or, or, or the shortbread and shortbread cookies. Um, Kind of the same format, the same plug and play, the same type of allegations have been made um, and are being made. And they are being made, as Trent said, not just in uh, the Southern District of New York and Eastern District of New York, where, where Spencer kind of you know, took off with all the, the labeling litigation, or in California, where he went next. But we've seen these in Wisconsin. We've seen these in, uh, 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 in Illinois, a lot in Illinois, frankly, frequently, uh, 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 recently uh, in Massachusetts. Uh, and so... Uh, whereas you could expect these to find these suits in, in a couple places, um, they, they are proliferating all over the place, both in terms of the type of products that are a part of the suits um, and the places in which they are filed. So be on the lookout. However, those suits um, still are following their familiar form. Um, they still have the same type of uh, uh, allegations. Um, basically, there's some word whether it be vanilla or uh, mint or smoked or uh, uh, mozzarella, um, that uh, isn't accurate according to Mr. Sheehan and his plaintiffs. Um, and, and they have the same consumer protection claim uh, uh, under the various state laws, uh, fraud, negligent representation, uh, Magnus and Moss, breaches of warranties, uh, uh, unjust enrichment. And so they follow the same forms, they follow the same, and so um, 
as a result, continuing to look at the vanilla cases, um, the decisions that have come down in those cases, while they may not be the right jurisdiction, you know, the right circuit, for instance, but A, are helpful in general, um, and B, um, provide at least a relatively good roadmap for uh, ways in which these, these suits may be defended. Um, the other part of this is Spencer has in these suits more recently started including not only a, a, a class for the state in which he has filed, but a multi-state class um, that seems to be kind of a shotgun approach um, regarding which states, except largely all of them seem to be cases, states where we don't see a lot of consumer class actions. Wyoming, uh, West Virginia, North Dakota, um, and we have all puzzled and scratched our heads and tried to figure out why these 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 uh, um, states are being chosen. There doesn't seem to be any common nexus between them. Um, if you have a beautiful mind uh, figured out whatever the code breaking is here, let us know. But otherwise, um, that is another kind of new wrinkle in these suits that we hadn't seen previously. And the last part is there has been no indication as of yet, and I will knock on all the wood in my office, that this change in venue, these change in products, this inclusion of these multi-state classes has had any substantive difference on the success level of these cases. Uh, past uh, results are not indicative of future performance, obviously, but um, it, this seems to be finding different pastures, but not perhaps greener pastures. I then wanted to talk, uh, typically we, we come on these calls and uh, we, we say a lot of stuff about packaged food and sometimes about retail and there's a bunch of folks who work in the um, alcoholic beverage industry, industry who um, listen along politely. Um, but we have seen an in, in uptick in cases related to alcoholic beverages. Yeah, whether actually right or wrong, I think for a long time there was a perception that well, alcohol is just something different, and it's 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 regulated by TTB, and there's a label pre-approval process, and so that just is different, and it's preempted, and don't worry about it. And kind of like every once in a while, you would see a USDA labeling case where there would also be label pre-approval. Alcohol label cases were few and far between, um, and those have recently really increased. Um, I think for a number of different reasons. Um, some of those dealing with uh, uh, hard seltzers and whether or not hard seltzers are covered by TTB uh, or if they're covered by FDA. And that, I think, as I understand it, has something to do with uh, whether the, the liquor in the hard seltzer is a malted or barley uh, uh, malt, malt beverage or malt, malt liquor, in which case it would be TTB, or if it's a sugar-based uh, uh, alcohol, in which case it might be, or at least is arguably covered by FDA, um, and has a different set of regulations. And so we've seen a, a with the proliferation of hard seltzers, seen a proliferation of labeling suits related especially to hard seltzers, but to alcohol more generally. So for instance, we've seen a couple suits, uh, the, the first suit there at the top, and then as well the, uh, the Wagner suit uh, for farther down below, Claims related to antioxidants or vitamin C's in hard seltzers, and the allegation basically being that you, manufacturer, have said you've put antioxidants or vitamin C um, in this uh, 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 alcoholic drink and have created this healthy halo that this is somehow good for consumers, and that vitamin C, those antioxidants aren't enough to outweigh the negative health effects of alcohol, and so you've tricked me. Um, that, uh, that, that the Wagner case involving uh, a Vizzy hard seltzer uh, was voluntarily dismissed. Uh, it could mean any number of things. I think some folks on the call may have a better idea than I what that meant, but that was a case that was filed um, and then uh, was voluntarily dismissed. So it was one of the first kind of cases uh, in the hard seltzer space. Um, but these have not been thrown out of court uh, on TTB preemption no matter what grounds. Uh, for instance, a case involving uh, the Rita's malt liquor products, these are, you know, uh, cans, uh, malt, malt beverage that uh, you know, are taste like margaritas or mojitos or uh, uh, wine spritzers, what have you, sangria. Um, th those, that case was allowed to proceed um, at least through uh, uh, the motion to dismiss on the GBL claims that it, it could be potentially deceptive. And so this was a case involving liquor that, that got past the 12B6. 
um, and, and was being litigated. And so we have seen more. If you have an alcoholic product or are interested in moving into the space, um, whether there's a, still preemption, not preemption, the scope of preemption, whether you're covered or not covered is, is thornier than what we can discuss here on the call. But uh, one thing you should know is there certainly is much more labeling litigation to think about, uh, good, bad, or other. And then finally, um, uh, we've talked about ESG, environmental sustainability, and governance claims. Um, these continue to be out there. They continue to grow. They continue to be a pain. Uh, I'll note two things briefly before I pass to, to, to Frank and Alicia. Um, there is a lot of form shopping that goes along with these. We, we are spending far more time knowing about the D.C. quote-unquote state courts um, uh, than we, we ever did before because that 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 uh, uh, Consumer Protection Statutory Scheme allows uh, consumer groups to step into the shoes of consumers and sue. Um, and the courts there have been very permissive in allowing that and wildly slow. Um, and so uh, that is something that there is a lot of form shopping when it comes to ESG claims that jurisdictions like D.C. Uh, might see a lot more action. The other is because these are so recent, it, it still is pretty unclear what the end goal is in some of these cases. Um, you know, we typically think none of these cases ever get tried, um, and it's, there's just resolution of some sort. Um, but what resolution looks like in cases like this? Um, do these groups want money? Do they want labeling changes? Do they want public ad campaigns? Do they want regulatory changes? Do they just want to embarrass companies? Um, the, the formula on how to resolve some of these suits, especially when there aren't your typical players on the other side who we kind of know what you do or don't want, that's an open question, and it's one that we're going to have to resolve as an industry, uh, figuring out how we, we, we handle those, what they want, how they want it, and uh, what's the best way to resolve those claims. So with that, uh, having uh, rocketed through, I will uh, pass to Frank. Um, thank you so much for your time, and I uh, look forward to talking to everyone soon. Thanks, Dan. Um, hey, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. As Trent mentioned, uh, I'm going to briefly introduce uh, sales practices portion of our uh, presentation and um, I will be quick um, and just to uh, keep with our festivist theme um, a couple of the class actions that we're seeing related to sales uh, practices recently filed um, are advertising uh, not about the products themselves but uh, really the ancillary benefits of buying the products uh, for example with this uh, National Floors Direct uh, case offering free installation, quick installation, uh, but allegedly it's not quick and fast enough. Uh, and then we have, uh, as you see, a slew of uh, cases related to um, shoes, um, dress clothes, uh, wetsuits that have been filed. Uh, advertising, you get 90% off the original price when um, the allegations are you can't uh, say it's off the original price when you never priced it at that price to begin with. Um, and so, again, these are just filed. Um, and much like the human fund, plaintiffs uh, allege that it really uh, benefits no one. Uh, so then the uh, two quick uh, sales practices cases related to DoorDash and food delivery services. Um, so for those uh, looking to DoorDash or Uber Eats, their Festivus meatloaf, uh, you'll probably purchase it for $20, and then by the time you get to checkout, you see you've gotten a delivery fee, a service fee, uh, and a number of other fees. And so both consumers and governments uh, have instituted lawsuits against uh, these food delivery services saying that's unfair and unconscionable because you're advertising delivery, but then we're having to pay service and suddenly our, uh, we're having to pay three times as much for um, the red sauce for the Festivus spaghetti. Um, but the companies haven't taken it sitting down. Uh, DoorDash, Uber Eats, and uh, Postmates have uh, sued the city of New York uh, trying to overturn their caps on fees. Um, the City Council capped fees during COVID to try and protect consumers. And so now uh, the consumers and governments are engaged in feats of strength uh, with the companies uh, trying to sort that all out. Um, and the key takeaway here is that just as you can always uh, have plaintiff's attorneys who are uh, 
going after claims on the labels, uh, as Ben pointed out, you can also have them going after claims on the other stuff related to the sales process. And so uh, that's just something to be cognizant about uh, as you move forward. And uh, with that, I will pass it over to Alicia. Thanks, Break, and hi, everyone. Um, I'm in the LA office here, and I know we are running close to our promised end time, so I'm going to try and breeze through this section. Oh, excuse me, that's actually not my slide. Okay, first off, updated on update on some changes that we discussed previously to the short form warnings that were proposed under Prop 65. As you may remember, in the beginning of the year, OEHA proposed changes to short form warnings. The quick update is that OEHA still has not issued its final statement of reasons or modifications to the short form warning amendments. After they issue their final statement of reasons, which could be following modifications and an, an additional comment period, the Office of Administrative Law will still have to take 30 working days to approve the regulation. We can expect that that approval is not going to be happening until sometime in 2022. And the warnings are required for products manufactured an additional year from the date of OAL's approval. So the takeaway for everyone is that updating lab updated labeling for Prop 65 will likely be required for products manufactured in 2023, sometime in 2023, assuming that OEHA gets going on finalizing them. However, the precise timing and final warning text is still unknown until we get that final statement of reasons. Another quick update on the acrylamide Prop 65 specific warnings that came out right before our last webinar in September. So we have proposed those new safe harbor warnings specifically for acrylamide in food that would add a subsection to Prop 65 regulations with tailored warnings for foods that contain acrylamide. The specific warnings are optional. You would still be able to use the standard safe harbor language under Prop 65. The comment period for that is now closed, closed on November 8th, and on the last day of the comment period, Cal Chamber of Commerce, as well as Consumer Brands Association and several other organizations and companies submitted a joint letter opposing the proposed warnings. They represent thousands of California-based and national businesses that produce, process, and prepare foods consumed by Californians. So just a quick summary of the arguments made in their comment letter is that the proposed warnings were a strategic tactic by OEHA to try and stall the Cal Chamber litigation rather than a sound policy approach that the Prop 65 warnings are completely inappropriate because neither the state of California nor any authoritative body knows that dietary acrylamide causes cancer in humans. And as long as there is a scientific controversy about this issue, the group says that but we will not be able to craft an acrylamide warning that is consistent with the First Amendment, that the warning at all about acrylamide under Prop 65 would be violating the First Amendment. So taking a very hard line there. And OEHA's proposal, they argue, will open the door for similarly misleading warnings that also point to existence of a controversy rather than warning of an actual exposure of a truly known carcinogen. So I think this is also a little bit of an of a reference to what happened in the wheat growers case and then the currently proposed specific warnings for glyphosate. So this is it with acrylamide the second time around, we're seeing a trend here. The group requested that their proposed rulemaking be completely withdrawn. So what to look out for next here is that there's a public, no public hearing scheduled, it'll only be scheduled upon request and that we has estimated that their rulemaking on the acrylamide warnings will be complete by April of 2022. Another quick update on a case that we've been discussing, the California Chamber of Commerce v. Becerra, which is currently pending in the Eastern District of California U.S. District Court, as well as on appeal in the Ninth Circuit. So as a quick refresher, the U.S. District Court issued a preliminary injunction back in March, which enjoined new lawsuits to enforce Prop 65 requirements for acrylamide in food and beverage. That case discusses that there's a lack, I mean, the, the in order issued by the court says that there's a lack of scientific evidence 
showing that acrylamide causes cancer in humans, meaning Prop 65 is compelling false speech by requiring companies warn that acrylamide, quote unquote, is known to the state of California to cause cancer, as required under those safe harbor warnings. An intervener, CERT, appealed the ruling in the Ninth Circuit, and the Ninth Circuit has now stayed the injunction. The next steps for that case are that now we have an oral argument date set for the Ninth Circuit on January 12th, 2022, and the U.S. District Court case seems to have completely stalled, similar to the wheat growers case, because of OEHA issuing those tailored warnings for acrylamide. So it seems that it's going to remain stayed and nothing substantive will be occurring in that case until after OEHA issues the final warnings, which may not be until April 2022 or realistically possibly later. So takeaway for this one is that we may have a ruling sometime in early 2022 on constitutionality of Prop 65 warnings for acrylamide contained in food and beverage products from the Ninth Circuit. This would be the first appellate decision on the First Amendment issue that's been coming up recently relating to Prop 65. The, the Ninth Circuit case related to the wheat growers and the chemical glyphosate is currently stayed and there's no oral argument set. Some quick trends in Prop 65 this year, there are a total of 2,953 notices of violations filed with the AG's office. Most common listed chemicals alleged in the notices include DEHP with over 1,000 notices. DEHP is a chemical that's added to some plastics to make them flexible. It's commonly found in food packaging, though many and majority of the notices that I saw were related to, ish, to, to products that are not food or beverage products, such as like wallets and um, fabrics and, and that sort of thing that may contain plastics. Lead had 600 notices filed for Prop 65, acrylamide 255, cadmium 205 notices, and arsenic had 73 notices filed in this past year. So some feats of strength in 2021, keeping with the festivist theme here. The big battle this year is between Prop 65 warnings and First Amendment rights. We have Cal Chamber versus the AG and CERT in a wrestling match that's definitely continuing into 2022. We also have the National Association of Wheat Growers and versus the Attorney General also in a fight that's ongoing. They had obtained a preliminary injunction in the U.S. District Court, also the Eastern District, and we have also stepped that, sorry, that is also on appeal in the Ninth Circuit, but it is also stayed pending the rulemaking by OEHA. So a similar story as what we've seen with acrylamide recently. And then the secondary feat of strength wrestling match we have going on is between the agency versus these groups of defendants um, in the Prop 65 world. So we have versus Cal Chamber and Wheat Growers in both fights. We have stepped into the ring by issuing these tailored warnings and attempting to regulate around weaknesses in the law. Wheat Growers and Cal Chamber cases, though, did achieve groundbreaking rulings, at least acknowledging at the district court level and in a preliminary stage that there are First Amendment violations potentially at issue. These fighters called out a key issue with Prop 65. Warnings are required under Prop 65 to state that a chemical is quote unquote known to cause cancer. However, Prop 65 does not actually require that the chemicals listed and those chemicals requiring the warnings are scientifically proven to cause cancer. This inconsistency has created a significant risk of misleading warnings that's called out in the wrestling matches going on in 2021. And OWEHA may have stalled the actions but it remains to be seen whether their tailored warnings are going to eliminate the First Amendment issue. Plus, promulgating tailored warnings every time this issue arises seems pretty impractical going forward. Could these cases actually lead to a festivist miracle? If this trend continues, it may ultimately require California to alter warning requirements under Prop 65 to guard against misleading warnings, potentially changing what is required for a chemical to be listed. And finally, the airing of grievances for Prop 65 from 2021. I'm sure many of you have some to add to this list. OEHA has frustrated Prop 65 defendants by refusing to acknowledge or meaningfully address the issues with Prop 65 labeling requirements and the First Amendment. 
the California Attorney General has disappointed Prop 65 bounty hunters by admitting that acrylamide is not known, quote unquote, to cause cancer in their briefing in the Cal Chamber case. And 2,953 notices of violation served this year definitely perturbed a number of manufacturers, retailers, and suppliers, many of whom may be listening right now who do business in California. It will definitely be a festivist miracle if no more Prop 65 notices are served before the end of the year. And with that, I'm going to pass it back to Trent to close us out. Yep, thank you so much, uh, everyone, for attending today. Thanks to our panelists. I did want to note that I did just send the survey to some of you. So if you receive it, uh, if you're able to take a couple of minutes out of your day and uh, fill it out for us, we'd be very, very deeply appreciative. Thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of the day and enjoy the holidays. Happy Festivus. Bye.